go ahead and we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, so thank you everybody and uh, welcome to the Thursday, October 6th meeting of the Land Use and Natural Resources Committee of SACOG. Uh, will everybody uh, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Let's go ahead um, and do roll call, please. Thank you, Chair Saragosa. Director Bullahan? Here. Frost? Here. Gialdo? Here. Gore? Here. Harris? Here. Kennedy? Here. New? Here. West? Absent Vice Chair Baines? Present. Vice Chair Clark Kretz? Here. And Chair Saragosa? Here. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Lynette, do we have any public communications uh, this afternoon? We do not have any public communications. All right, then uh, we'll keep me uh, move my volume up here a little bit more. All right, uh, so we will then uh, move on to the consent calendar and those are uh, items one and two, uh, with one being um, the allowing us to meet uh, remotely. Any questions on the consent? Do we have any public comments on? Uh, yes, Director no, New. No, no question. I was just going to move the item. And Thank I'll, you. I'll second Clark Kretz seconds. All right. We have a first and a second. Um, uh, roll call, please. Director Bullahan? Aye. Director Frost, could you indicate your vote? Aye. Thank you. Gialdo? Aye. Gore? Aye. And Lynette, we just can't hear you very well. That's why. Yeah, I didn't oh. hear it. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. I'll have our tech team uh, turn up the volume. Uh, Director Gore, could you indicate your vote? Aye. Harris? Yes. Kennedy? Aye. New? Aye. West absent, Vice Chair Baines? Aye. Vice Chair Clark Kretz? Yes. And Chair Saragosa? Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you, Lynette. Uh, so we will now move on then to our action item. Uh, we have one item uh, for us this afternoon, and that's item three, and that's to adopt findings uh, from the reasonably available control measure analysis for inclusion in the eight hour ozone state implementation plan. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> and Renee uh, has this for us this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Renee. Can you hear me now? Okay, no. excellent. Uh, a little bit. Not very well. Oh, well, how about now? Is that good? That's good. Okay. Yes. All right. Whew. All right. Good afternoon, Renee Devere Oki. Um, you already read the action item. I'll give you the condensed version, which is to recommend our um, reasonably available control measure findings um, onto the board, and then we'll move those on to the air districts for inclusion in their plan. I'm going to do a quick pause while our slides get pulled up here. And while she's doing that, so back in April, um, you heard what I like to call our Air Quality 101 presentation. Um, and David Yang from the SAC Metro Air District, who's joining me today virtually, um, was here helping me uh, walk through that conversation. And so he'll be available to answer any questions that you have on the SIP side as we go through this today. But noting that it's been a few months, um, I wanted to do a quick highlight and walk through some of the context settings before we jump into this analysis that we are going to be having to take action on today. And so to kick that off, um, 
I wanted to note that we've got five regional air district partners who join us in our air quality and transportation planning work. So as you're very much aware, um, we develop a federally required long range transportation plan called the MTP, which is our 20 year look into the future. We also develop what's called our MTIP or Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Program, which is our implementation document of our MTP. So it contains projects that receive funding and are on their way to design right away construction and even operation. Because we are a non-attainment area, uh, we need to make sure that we are building and planning for does not impede the ability of our region to meet clean air goals. For this reason, we collaborate with all of our five air districts in their state implementation work or air quality planning work, so SIP. Um, got lots of acronyms in this one. So the way that many of you are seeing um, this work is from a SACOGS lens specifically is our work on conformity. So as local agencies, we are collecting and analyzing your projects to see if they are exempt or non-exempt from air, um, air quality conformity. Um, looking at do they add capacity or not? And also when will they be open to traffic and how will that impact our regional system? So within our conformity analysis, we're looking to see what is the trajectory of emissions at key milestones and are they in alignment with the targets in our regional air quality plans or the SIPs? Bottom line um, is that if an air district plan shows that we are achieving clean air standards by a specific date, we must analyze that in our MTP work and the projects leading up to that date to make sure that they are in alignment with that milestone. So transportation or on road mobile is just one component of the SIP. Um, there are other components like stationary sources, other mobile area wide sources that are looked at close, more closely by the Air District's CARB as well as our federal government. Inventories are developed to determine what sources in the region are contributing to the current air quality. And then rules, regs, regulations, um, actions, control strategies are all reviewed, developed, analyzed, and also quantified um, to see when compiled if they can form what's called an attainment or a maintenance demonstration. And so this is a compilation of state, federal, local actions and how the implementation of each will get us to cleaner air. So current planning um, efforts are five air districts are developing a plan to demonstrate how the region will attain the 2015 ozone standard, which is set by EPA. The districts will submit a request to um, develop a plan that demonstrates an attainment by 2032, and this is what's called a severe plan. Um, a specific federal requirement in developing this plan is to see if there are measures that can be pulled into the plan that could advance attainment by one year or, up or move that attainment year from 2032 to 2031. So the name for this regulatory process is a RACM analysis or a reasonably available control measure analysis. Stationary measures are looked at by the air districts. Mobile and some area-wide sources are looked at by CARB, and SACOG looks at transportation. So an easy way to think about this process is, are there new rules or measures that can be approved, funded, and put into place that could generate enough calculable emissions reductions to advance regional attainment by year? So um, noting that framework, it's a pretty narrow window. So SACOG conducts the on-road portion of the Rackham process. Um, as part of this process, SACOG looks at transportation control measures, or more specifically strategies to reduce motor vehicle trips, vehicle miles traveled, or vehicle idling and associated air pollution emissions for potential inclusion in this demonstration, so the air district plans. So the Rackham process can be described really as multi-step, includes identification of potential control measures, the evaluation of these measures, and then finally their overall fit in the Rackham process. So there's three portions to that Rackham process. So de determining if the implementation of transportation control measures with all other control measures could att um, advance attainment by a year is ultimately the goal of the process. For a little bit of context, SACOG has one SIP identified transportation control measure in place. So this is a longstanding me measure that's been in place since 2008. It was identified uh, as part of, in part of the Rackham process in 19, for the 97 standard. And then when we did this last Rackham process back in 2016, so we don't do these very often, 
Um, it was moved um, for inclusion as a voluntary control measure commitment. And as you can see on the screen, uh, provides education on air quality, uh, updates on an hour in current readings, and helps promote voluntary driving reductions. So at one point, uh, this was a new measure. It could be calculated, and then it was included as a SIP as a way to advance attainment for an earlier standard. And it's had staying power because this measure has the ability to influence emissions on our most polluted days. Uh, one thing to note about transportation control measures, if they are included in a SIP, the, we must report on them as, and their implementation as part of every conformity determination we conduct. Uh, if it is not being implemented, then we would not be in compliance with federal regulations, and that would put our federal funds at risk. So I'm going to move on to the process that we just did. So for our latest rack and process, we pulled candidate measures from several sources. This included our last eight-hour ozone SIP developed by the districts, looking at the 2008 health standard. We looked at control measures that are being, uh, were considered in this a similar analysis from other California MPOs and non-attainment areas. And we asked the regional planning partnership and our email list for any measures that they would like us to consider in this analysis. So the next step, we had roughly 215 measures um, in this report. And so we compiled the measures to align with the 16 categories of um, what's called transportation control measures in the Clean Air Act, so just kind of a categorical alignment. And then we went through the process to identify what was being implemented or used in the region before, and what came out of this evaluation or what we call candidate control measures. So think of this step as identifying what new measures could potentially be used. So in looking at those measures for the candidate control measures, there was approximately 70. Uh, we needed to review each according to Rackham guidance, so this is that kind of more regulatory guidance. Factors to be considered included technical and economic feasibility, enforceability, local applicability, and the ability to provide emission reductions before attainment deadlines, so the attainment advancement from that 2032 to the 2031 year. Our assessment was qualitative um, for us to see what could fit, fit into this narrow window. And so a little bit on technological feasibility is does the technology exist and also is it still relevant? Economic feasibility is a look at the cost versus emission benefits. And um, there's some things, other factors that are, would this cause substantial widespread or long-term adverse impacts? So that, has, that had to be considered. And fun language that's pulled from the regulatory guidance is, is a control measure absurd, unenforceable, or impractical? Um, so in summation, uh, we pulled together a list of 215 potential measures. Of these, 146 were identified as already being implemented. Uh, 69 were identified as not feasible at this time, as in they, going back to that previous slide, they did not fit technological, um, economic, or, or ability to um, implement. And so if you're looking at the document, that's table 5.6 that goes through and runs through these different measures and our reasoning as to why they can't, they're not infeasible at this time. And for purposes of SACOG rack and process, our finding is that we are actually already implementing all feasible measures. So um, SACOG staff will be working with the five air districts in the region um, to pass this forward as they go on to their next steps in the process. Um, so after we hand this off to the board, we'll take it to the air districts. Each of the five air districts will be including it into their demonstration. Um, so it's going to go through another set of public processes. And then finally, it will be submitted to CARB for action and then passed on to EPA as part of that larger ozone SIP demonstration. So I know that was a lot of uh, information, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. And if you have any air quality SIP specific questions, David is available to answer those as well. Thank you, uh, and thank you, David, too, uh, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, colleagues, any questions or comments? <laughs> it's a quiet crowd today. All right. Uh, 
Lynette, do we have any public comments on this item? There's no public comment. Uh, so what's the, uh, the timeline now going forward um, as it goes, as it moves on to the next, the next phase? So we'll provide this to the Air District and they're conducting their portion of the Rackham, looking at the stationary sources as well as a little bit of carb work. Um, another component that will be coming back in either the next month or two is we're going to be working on conformity budgets for the ozone standard. So that will be the next action item and that also gets folded into the plan. And so then once we hand that off to um, David and his team, I'll let you walk through the rest of that if you want to explain the timelines on your end, David. Yes, uh, thank you, Renee. Uh, David Yang with the uh, Sacramento Air Quality Management District. Um, so what mm -hmm. happens is after we receive um, uh, say Cog's recommend analysis is we look at our recommend analysis combined to see if we get advanced attainment um, by one year. Um, after we f figure out what our attainment is, we could go in and start um, um, working towards uh, packaging up our our, SIP, uh, our state implementation plan. Um, and of course, we'll we'll need to have um, continued discussion with with we'll say Cog and developing the uh, the more more vehicle emission budgets. Um, once we have that ready, then we'll take our plan to um, to our respected uh, air boards. So there's five of us. So there's five air districts that needs to approve the plan. Once the plan is approved, we then move forward it, uh, uh, to the state for their uh, review and approval. And after they approve it, then they send it off to EPA. Understood. And and the once it gets to CARB, I mean, is it have we have they made like any major or changes or asked us to in the past or has it pretty much, you know, it's, as long as it's gone through a pretty robust public process that it, it stayed as as presented to them? Yeah, as as far as I'm concerned, you know, the the SIP is, is, is a huge plan document. Um, you know, the the wrecking part of it just a small portion of that. Um, so the whole thing will be reviewed. Um, we haven't had any issues in the past um, with that. Um, but who, mm -hmm. who who's to say we won't have any more issues? Right. It's, it's um, um, it just depends on you know how much review they're 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 gonna take to look at the document and you know if it conforms to their guidance and, and regulations. The hope is that it it, it will uh, it won't cause any more issues. <laughs> Understood. Uh, yes. Uh, yep. Thank you. Sorry, I, I don't see a way to raise my hand. Um, so this is really interesting and I appreciate it. I appreciate the hard work. Um, as I read through the things that were considered and then not recommended, right? I mean, wide range of ideas, but not very necessarily feasible or really expensive to implement. Um, and we've already got the 140 some odd that, we, that we're doing as a region, right? Um, and I guess to that question that Michael, you post, does anybody come back and say, oh, yes, you have to now have truck only lanes or eco driving educational programs or, you know, some of these are interesting suggestions, which is why they're not feasible economically. Um, any put would we again end up getting pushback saying, yes, you have to do this. So it's kind of that little like the filter slide that I showed as you're putting them forward. And it, it comes down to if can they be quantified and it, cumulatively, if you took all these kind of independent measures, would they actually add up to something that would move the needle a year? And that's, and that's really what would trigger it to be included. Other than that, it's kind of this analytical process just to see like, is there, is there anything that we are missing or could do. Um, so that's not to say that transportation control measures could be considered outside of a SIP process. So that's something like these types of measures could be submitted for like a funding round application or something. Um, but the, the trick is there has to be an authority that, you know, can implement it, um, have all the work done, have the financial setup willing to do it. And like, if you say you're going to be demonstrating a certain amount of emission reductions, like you have to do that. Um, what's an interesting kind of factoid on this is if you were to put something into the SIP 
and you change or the emissions don't result in that, then you have to go through a substitution process and find another measure that you could put into place. So it creates a whole different kind of regulatory paperwork process where you're then folding in new items. Interesting, thank you. So if we had a suggestion, then it didn't work, then you're really stuck. There's really no incentive to actually try anything because then you get slapped for not actually getting it done. That's okay. Well, I will refrain from making further comments. Mm -hmm. No, you're right, Bonnie. I mean, that was the thing that came up, you know, we were doing the briefing on this. And so it was and it's essentially in perpetuity that you have to keep doing that item, um, regardless if you're hitting, you know, that attainment goal, because you still would have to swap it out for something. So, yeah, it's it really is a disincentive uh, on this process. So. OK, any any other comments or questions? All right. Um, so seeing none, um, I will entertain a motion. I'll move approval of the item as proposed. Second. Thank Frost. you. Thank you, uh, Director Frost and Director Gore. Okay. Um, with that, uh, any public comments, Lynette? No public comment. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Director Bullahan? Aye. Frost? Aye. Gialdo? Aye. Gore? Aye. Harris? Yes. Kennedy? Aye. New? Aye. West, absent. Vice Chair Baines? Aye. Vice Chair Clark Kretz? Yes. And Chair Saragosa? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you, Lynette. Uh, thank you, Renee. Thank you, David. Um, also, this might be the best acronym I've seen for a government program, Rackham. So there's that as well. <laughs> All right. So moving on to our information items and to item four. Uh, and this is going to be uh, a look ahead on Green Means Go, our early activation applications. And uh, Garrett has this information item for us. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. And good morning, members or afternoon, excuse me, members of the committee. Yeah, excited to talk to you about Green Means Go. So the purpose of my item is to give you some background. This is an information item for the action item you'll be taking next month, a funding um, action item. But before I get into that, I just wanted to give a little bit of context on Green Means Go. It's been a busy year for us. Um, we're really excited in standing up this new program. I don't know if you saw uh, James's executive director report, but uh, we're moving forward this fall. A lot of things coming to a head of, of four different technical assistance activities. We're partnering with the Urban Land Institute, or UOI, and they've, they've been a really great partner in that. They're sort of the conduit to um, development, to the private sector. Um, and so we're, we're looking at those Green Means Go uh, technical activity, technical assistance activities this fall with four different jurisdictions. We've been asked to get together all the infrastructure providers for a convening. But of course, the main thing we've been working on in Green Means Go this calendar year is standing up the new Green Means Go funding program. Right, we're really fortunate to um, the, as a whole region as a whole to have received that Green Means Go funding from the state, 34 million. And the board, you as this committee, as the recommending committee and the board, you've been making those incremental actions, right? You made the action of saying these new state funds coming to the region will be Green Means Go. You took the action on the budget, you took the action on the guidelines to sort of you know, give more detail to what the funding program would be about. And, and, and we, we laid out in those guidelines, three different categories for that 34 million. Right, to get at some of the key objectives we're trying to get at Green Means Go. I'll talk about the three um, real quickly. The first, early activation. And so as the, the staff items title alludes to, that's, that's the item that's gonna be in front of you uh, next month for, for action. That's a $3 million program. So it's, a, it's smaller than the other two. And as the name applies, it's meant to get those sort of early wins in Green Means Go that we can point to the state, right? And get some really great projects moving forward. And then the other two, are called planning and capital. And so those collectively add up to over 30 million. So almost 10 times as, as large as this first, um, first category. And those are to, we, you know, we recognize that uh, these infill projects for Green Means Go and the own locally adopted green zones, they're on this continuum of development readiness. So there's some planning dollars available to help those, you know, those corridors get more development ready. And there's some capital dollars available to help actually support the infrastructure. So um, your, your, your local staff, the cities and county staffs are, are working hard on, on those applications for those second two categories, planning and capital, which are due at the end of this month for that 30 plus million. But the applications for the first category, early activation have already closed. So you see in attachment B, the applications we got, got in that category. 
we're, we're working hard as, as Hickok staff and in, um, initiating our review process. And we'll come back to you next month with, with our staff recommendation. And, and just a reminder then of how that process works. So, so we'll present to you a staff recommendation for the funding. And you know, there's 3 million available. There's over 5 million in requests. A couple of things about that. First, at the direction of, of the board and you know, some lessons learned from our transportation funding practice, we've been working really hard this whole calendar year, especially the last couple of months, what we call the pre-application phase. So we're talking with all of the, the um, you know, project sponsors in the cities and counties about these projects to talk about, are they a good fit? You know, what category should they should fit in? And so we, we expected about this number of projects to come in. And then the, um, and, you know, the second point is the, with $3 million available in the program, that's also um, a limiting you know, factor and that this just, it's, it's less money. And then third, this is early activation, working for those early wins. You know, for great momentum and green is go, but also these dollars have a very quick turnaround. Originally, the, the money and the um, infrastructure had to be built by 2023. It was a really quick turnaround, but thanks to feedback we received from our partners, and um, we were able to work with, with the state funder in this to extend that to 2024. But still, 2024 is a, a short timeline from an infrastructure perspective. So that's also one of the um, sort of factors when um, sort of projects were thinking about coming in. They need to be the right size, they need to be the right timing, they need to fit the right criteria. So long-winded way of saying, you know, these, these are the, the ones we identified in that pre-application phase is, you know, seeming to, to make the fit of real activation. We very much expect in the other two categories, the planning and the capital, to have a lot more projects coming in from um, across the region in those. And that that's the, you know, uh, the, the more broader eligibility in the longer timeline to spend those funds. So, uh, you know, again, it's always, uh, you know, the other thing about this pre-application phase is, you know, these are, these are, we went through all these projects and, you know, we all at, at the staff level said these seem to, you know, meet the criteria of Green Means Go. So as always, you know, it's an oversubscribed program. I think our message to the state is this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg, right? We know there's far more than 5 million, you know, we got 5 million in requests and there's far more than 5 million in sort of Green Means Go infrastructure needs. It's more of a reflection of the funding availability in this category. Um, and so, you know, what we'll come forward to you next month with our recommendation, the staff report lays out the criteria we look at, um, but we just want to call attention to that criteria because we know it's it's always a, you know, a, a tough job to be making those funding recommendations. These are all great Green Means Go projects. And so our recommendation will come down to those criteria that we agreed upon at the onset of the process of um, moving forward with this. So happy to answer any questions about that. And if not, we'll look forward to coming back next month with our recommendation to you all. All right, thank you, Garrett. Uh, any questions or comments on the Green Means Go update? Right. I do, I, I will say I'm, I was, I'm really uh, not surprised, but I, I'm really happy to see those pre-applications that came in and, and knowing that we have choices uh, that are that are gonna be put forward. Uh, and then knowing that, and so I, and I, I think I asked, I asked this during, uh, you know, getting ready for this meeting, but so those that don't, so, if, they're obviously we won't be able to do all of them with that five million, but for some of those, will those still be eligible to to be put forward for the larger pot of the second tranche of, of dollars uh, if you don't get it on the pre-application side? Yeah, a great question, Chair. So um, yeah, this category is kind of the microcosm, and and some of them actually do translate well as they could sort of fit in in a couple of the categories. For some of them, if they were not to be able to be um, part of the staff recommendation, this um, this first category, they could very well fit in those larger categories. And I, and I think um, uh, you know I think the sponsors you know thought that through, right? And, and you know I think they um, right think there was a, a good alignment with this category, but some of them probably think if it, if it doesn't fit in this category, they'll they'll look to those other two. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I know. I know my, uh, you know, Placerville. We were interested. I, it was it was a timing issue for us, um, in, in, you know, on this on this first run. But I, I'm pretty sure we'll, you know, we'd be moving forward with something on, on that second one, and and hope everybody else uh, uh, that has a green zone is put something forward as well. I, I will say, you know, you know, this this may be more of a policy and innovation uh, issue, but and James as for our our lobbying team, but. You know, so next year, you know, we're probably looking at a four, I mean, everyone, the conventional wisdom is a four to $6 billion deficit at the state next year. Um, however, that's somewhat, um, that will be easy to remedy um, because of the large amount of uh, funding that the state has socked away over the last couple of cycles uh, and money that they categorically kind of put over the next few, um, um, you know, the next few budgets. So I, I do think 
you know, going forward next year, there's still a possibility for another round of, of funding. Um, we're going to have to be, I think, aggressive about it so that it doesn't get fall on the wayside. But I do think there still will be opportunities now. Fiscal year 24, 25, you know, and going that direction, I think it's just going to get potentially worse. And we're going to see larger, you know, as long as we don't get back to those $20 billion budget deficits again, uh, where you're going to see wholesale probably changes in, in the way things are funded, um, they'll be able to, to deal with a, a single digit deficit, which, you know, obviously a lot of money, but for a state budget now, it's uh, easily fixable to some degree. So just some for foreshadowing, I think, of what's coming up next year and what we should be looking at as, you know, after elections and going back to our legislative delegation to see what we can do. Yeah, Chair Saragosa, and definitely, definitely hear your point, right? And it would, it, um, as Garrett said, and he's been saying for a while, we know that even if, uh, even with all the 34 and the plus the four, 38 million, that's a drop in the bucket, right? So there's the state opportunity as you're describing and also the federal opportunity because even with the Inflation Reduction Act, we now have some programs there that we need to really sort of pursue um, and see if there's a, there's a there there between where, what we need for Green Means Go and, and some of the federal funding now available. Absolutely, no, thank you. Okay, any other comments? All right, seeing none, Garrett, thank you very much. And we will look forward to uh, seeing those recommendations come through. Great. All right, uh, we will move on to our uh, item number five uh, for in our information items. And that is uh, scenario planning uh, for a triple bottom line equity economy environment and the Envision Utah case study. And uh, Casey has uh, this item for us. Thank you, Casey. Yes, that's right. Um, thank you, Chair Saragosa. Can you hear me all right? It's a little light. Um, it's a little low. How about now? Is this better? No? Oh, testing, testing, about the same. Testing. We can hear you, but it's, it's, it's low. How's this? Is better. This yeah. I want it to be great. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so uh, I am here today to tee up a the workshop that is going to your board later this month. Um, we will have two guest speakers, Ari Bruning with uh, Envision Utah, and Andrew Gruber, who is with uh, he's the executive director for the Wasatch Front Regional Council. I believe at least three of you were on our Salt Lake tour um, this summer, uh, and uh, so hopefully some of what I talk about here will. Um, spur some memories and some thoughts for you because uh, my goal today is to get your feedback uh, and questions that we can share with our guest speakers to help hone their um, uh, to help hone their workshop for the board so um, you will SACOG will be undertaking undertaking an update of our long-range plan uh, we're calling it blueprint we're planning on a lot more engagement with stakeholders this time, with your local agencies, with private and nonprofit interests, with uh, the region's residents, all to help define how this plan will achieve a triple bottom line uh, to accommodate all of the growth of the, of the region over the next 30 years. And we'll be looking at different pathways into the future and how can we best shape our engagement on those pathways to help everyone in the region be able to learn together uh, and to hopefully come up with a, um, a cohesive uh, uh, regional plan to make that happen. So Envision Utah is, uh, and, and, the, and the Salt Lake area is a case study for, uh, for all of us to take a look at. Um, in fact, the original SACOG blueprint was inspired by um, scenario planning that was done at Envision Utah, where um, they engaged in fact, the entire state in a, um, in a scenario planning exercise to envision what, what their communities across the state could look like. What is interesting about this case study and why we want to bring this um, to you is that uh, Envision Utah continued engagement um, and worked closely with, uh, Envision Utah is this nonprofit organization that really has been stewarding, visioning, um, across the state of Utah, but they've also worked very closely with the Wasatch Front Regional Council, which is SACOG's counterpart um, over in Salt Lake, on the implementation of that. And so when 
when uh, your, you know, a number of your colleagues went to Salt Lake um, this summer to uh, to see how um, policy gets turned into action, to see, you know, different kinds of transit-oriented development and transit and different kinds of infrastructure investments. There was a theme throughout that entire um, tour of um, an understanding of the vision that every community uh, was trying to implement, both within their community and as part of this greater regional um, regional strategy that uh, that Envision Utah had um, had helped to create, and that the Wasatch Front Regional Council um, implements as the as the Metropolitan Planning Organization. So, uh, my my hope is that part of this is jogging some of your memories from that tour. And what we're looking for is what kinds of questions or what types of topics might you be interested in, again, so that we can really try to tailor this workshop to dig in a bit deeper, um, to explore how what we can learn in this region to make our, our own um, visioning and planning exercise um, that much more successful. And so with that, I am looking forward to any feedback, questions that you may have, and we'll be, we'll be prepping with them. Um, in a few days. All right. Thank you, Casey. Um, I'll look to my colleagues that made it on the trip. So I know Bonnie was on it. Um, I have a question. It's maybe not. Well, it is a little bit pertinent to the trip, right? So one of the things we saw in Salt Lake City was this concerted effort to build around transit areas um, and develop to develop around transit areas and then put some transit uh, like uh, lines through more higher density areas. You know, as we're talking about Green Means Go and infill areas, um, I I would, I mean, our residents don't know this, right? Like here we've got this effort to do these Green Means Go green infill areas, right? How do we educate people about them, talk about it, let them see the vision of infill areas? I think that that's really important because we've been talking about this but if we're going to do, if we end up doing a lot of what we did with the blueprint, where you're having people sitting around tables and brainstorming, I think we should talk about these infill areas and the, the benefit of them and the benefit of this higher density housing near transit and all the benefits, right? Because I, I don't know, that's certainly a, a different conversation than however long ago the blueprint was 20 years or so ago. So that's that's my first thought. You know, through the chair, I I, I kind of I, I do agree with, with everything Bonnie just said. I also one of the concerns that I have is uh, at least up here in Utah City, people are so used to the old school way of doing life, driving everywhere, and, and we're we're trying to, you know, backfill with, you know, this bike path is really exciting project. But um you know, we have other projects that are perhaps if we have like a senior housing project, for example, um, they can't, unless you have a bus stop right out front or, or with something really close, it's not, they won't, they can't get to it. So they may as well be on an island, at least some of them. And so ways to get, um, not necessarily, you know, only just speaking about the senior folks, but ways to get people to change their paradigm up here in a farming community in an old school and they, they deal with it but it's getting people to buy off on that idea and why uh which i think kind of piggybacks on bonnie's thing is getting getting the message out as to the benefits and trying to change things up and getting transit on board too i, I guess it's very expensive just to add a bus stop i asked that in a meeting yesterday and uh and i kind of got whoa we, how dare you even ask right and so um there's a little bit of a barrier there that we're trying to get through. And uh, I would be open to some help with that. Yeah, those are both, I mean, I, I agree with both of those comments. Uh, I mean, certainly, uh, and especially during the pandemic, I mean, our our transit agency just got hammered. Um, and, you know, I don't know how it's quite actually gonna ever re recover to the point where, you know, it's it, obviously all transit agencies don't quote unquote turn a profit, but, to the extent that they, you know, can actually maintain lines and, you know, get people to where they want to go. I mean, to to Sean's point as well, you know, in a in a more rural community, um, you know, just 
you know, how, how does that, that work? So we get people out of their cars and, you know, there's sort of a, a distrust level, if you will, as well, when it, you know, when you come and talk to people about uh, mass transit and as you said, old, old school way of doing things and people are used to driving in their vehicles. So it's a, sometimes a tough sell. I mean, outside of me bringing a senior veterans housing uh, you know, anything else that outside of something like that might, will, will be met with distrust and, you know, whether it's too, too compacted or whether it's too many houses that are taking up land. So I, I get hit from both sides when it comes to the type of how, you know, housing that's, that's being built. When I think too, for what I see, um, there's no examples for people to see. We went out to, to Utah and we saw those great communities that they built around these transits and, and it was so convenient. We don't have anything like that here for people to see that it's livable and doable. And I think that's kind of part of the, we haven't seen it and been used to it. So they, they just don't have the concept. You know, Jill, that's, that's a good idea. You know, I was thinking maybe um, on the, on our next trip or whatnot, we, we bring some of our local media with us so they could help get the message out for us. They'll have cameras and they, they're good writers. And you know what I mean? That way people can put their eyeballs on something that way. Yeah. Okay, even Bonnie, you know, the other day when we were in meeting, you'd said the same thing we were talking about, Hey, as people are want to give up their homes, having that thought to go, would I live above, on a, above a business below and be in a downtown community and walkable? That sounds fabulous. But again, I don't, you know, we don't have that around or the product available for people to, to get that idea of a, a true community. Yeah, encouraging people to think about their next steps of where they might live when they can't live on the one acre and or want to travel and they just want to close up their home and take off and not worry about uh, the backyard and the landscaping and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think people, and you know, I think it comes back to too, we're not taking away your current way of life. You know, we're not getting rid of the ranchettes and the single family housing, we're looking at additional options that will benefit people. And, and yeah. I was getting them to, to see that something's different than single family housing, especially, right? I mean, maybe in downtown Sacramento, they've got it, but the rest of us don't have a lot of high density housing. And, and honestly, like we now have a couple affordable housing complexes in Roseville and they're they're nicely done and they haven't caused problems and it's great to see. But boy, people were super nervous before it came. Well, and Bonnie, isn't it true though, the demographics in Placer County, we've we've got aging an aging population that's really high. And it sounds like this vision in Utah was born of the same crisis. And you know, maybe it would be important for that you know, the, the statistics of that to be included in the workshop, Casey, because, you know, I'm dealing it with my sister right now, who's, you know, unfortunately going to have to leave her eight and a half acres in Garden Valley and try to find a place in Auburn and, um, you know, but I mean, that's in El Dorado County, but also in Placer County, we do have an aging population and it's very high. No, it's a, it, that's a good comment, Jan, as well. I mean, and I see some of that is because um, we do the same. El Dorado County, we have an aging population as well, and and we're we're in a dire shortage of like workforce housing, and you know, for those sort of coming behind that next generation that you know maybe can't walk into an eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollar home, um, you know, whether that's El Dorado Hills or other parts of El Dorado County, uh, but you know, where do you where do you start? Where do you get them in? And and I think that's. That's a conversation that that we're trying to have in the county. It's it's a difficult one to have because again, whenever you try to say, well, we need to build a couple of hundred houses here, it's like, you know, we're a rural county. We don't want that density um, in, in our backyard. And so it's again going to an education because it's like, well, that's great, but at some point we're gonna need that next generation to be able to get into a house and, and live somewhere and so they're not driving down to Sacramento always, or you know, we can have a more another place for people to come live. Yeah, because my, my sister, who's from Garden Valley, she chose that because that's the lifestyle she wanted to live. And so I, I live in Placer County. I live in Loomis. You know, she's not interested in, in being in Loomis. She really wants to be more in a hill town like Auburn. And 
um, you know, I just, I just think it's, um, I think it's interesting that the vision Utah, it was born of their crisis of what I think we are facing. So interesting. I mean, the only the other thing I would throw out there, Casey, is I mean, from the equity lens, you know, anything that they've done. I mean, obviously, this is a new, you know, uh, line of, of of work for us. And so, anything again, I think best practices, anything that they've done, anything that they've seen, you know, the whole rural, suburban, urban dynamic, and how they've dealt with that, maybe as a as our counterpart um, in in Utah, would be interesting information to know or to ask about. Jerry Saragosa, it's um. First of all, this is a really, really good conversation and good feedback because in some ways what I hear you all saying is, uh, and this, I, you know, I think as, as a planning agency, sometimes we talk in acronyms and TOD and, you know, green means go. And uh, you're really talking about like, how do we connect to people, right? And our constituents in our region, which by the way, as we go around to your city councils and board of supervisors, and we've probably done half now, um, teeing up the lot in the next long range plan, I think there's a lot of great basic questions about how do we engage the region? How do we how do we pull people into a regional dialogue? And as a reminder, and uh, Director Clark Gretz, you know, you're, you're, you're making nice through lines here back to Utah. Uh, they did a, not, not unlike we did in 2003 and four, but I think a, a really impressive job about getting the state engaged in a conversation all the way to the governor about the future of the state and growth patterns and, and choices uh, that you know the state and all the local governments were kind of had in front of them back in the late 1990s. So, so uh, this theme of how do we speak in a language on these issues that, that everybody can relate to, um, I think is, is one we're hearing in your, in your boards and councils and, and I think one that we could certainly ask both of our presenters in our, at the board meeting to, to touch on. And the, the final thing I'll say, just as, the, as I often talk about being the father of three teenagers, is I often sometimes think we should talk in terms of you know, free range teens, or if, if a, can a teenager get somewhere, and it's the same thing with seniors, right? As you're, if you're an aging, like it, it, transit is good and important and effective, but also is your community designed for safety and walkability? Can you get places? Are you, is it safe to cross the street? Um, do you have trails and sidewalks? And, um, and is, there, is there some way that we can translate those values, maybe even into data that people can connect to? I always think that if, if a teenager can get somewhere at 14 by themselves and you feel safe as a parent, that's, that's a good sign. And that's something that a lot of people connect to. I have that, sorry. That was sorry. one of the coolest things a few years back when we did the tour at Cap to Cap when, in that neighborhood in particular where we went around and you saw school got out, there were kids everywhere going to the stores, going to their houses. I thought that was, that really stood out to me to see the freedom of the kids to be in their neighborhood and have those opportunities there too. And James, to your point about, is it, is it accessible and walkable and safe for teenagers? The same for seniors. And I think often, you know, we forget about our seniors and we've got some communities are growing with young people, right? And in a lot of ways, they need some of the same things. Walkability, accessibility, um, areas to, to gather together and have community, um, you know, gathering places. So sharing that, right? Because a lot of communities are thinking only about kids and sometimes we're forgetting about the seniors, but there's there's need for both and sharing those similarities versus the differences. I think Jill mentioned a comment to me. She was one of the challenges about like me living in downtown Roseville one day when there's like finally, you know, lots of housing for somebody like me to move into my way to sell my single family home. She was, you know, you can have older folks who want quiet by nine o'clock and then the young partiers, you know, who want to party and have a good time. Um, but I don't know, find a way to, I mean, I live with young families right now and I love it because right? they're not all me. So anyway. Um, good points. I know for me, and my wife thinks I'm crazy because I always say, well, we have a house. It's all got to be like relatively close to a hospital because something happens. I want to be able to like, I don't want to die on my way to the hospital. Like at least get, get me there. So 
<laughs> I want to make sure we have those facilities nearby as well. Through the chair, I just want to yes. mention, I think the, the whole beauty of that development was just that 15 minute process or whatever they were, what the, the tagline was, was 15 minute communities to where you could walk to, like you just mentioned, a hospital or, you know, a school. I mean, again, through transportation, I mean, you, whether you got on a bus or if you got on to, you know, the, the rail system there that you could be anywhere within 15 minutes. And that um, where we're at, the um, council member Harris could test this is, we don't even have a hospital in our community. You know, I mean, this is, so we need to bring those amenities. We need to bring those, those um, <clears throat> facilities into our community. But, but I, I think it was great. I think it was an amazing experience. Um, just the multi, um, you know, like when we were talking about mixed use and having the storefronts on the bottom floor, the living on top, having everything there within walking distance. I think the first thing was mentioned was that um, I average household only had one vehicle. And I think probably in Yuba City, it's probably four or five. You know, there's, I think there's as many, as many residents in the house and probably one extra one. But um, <laughs> You know, I mean, this is from a emission standpoint and traffic and all that type of stuff. I mean, I think the process was, I, I think the, the vision was amazing and I would love to see something like that implemented someday in our community. Thank you, Vice Chair. Hey, any other comments? Casey, anything that um, we haven't touched upon or you wanna ask us? This, uh, no. This, this conversation was great. There's, there's a lot of richness here. So I think we will be able to tee up a really a great workshop for you that, that we hope will continue on. Like the conversation will continue on with this committee and the board as we move into the blue pin. So thank you so much. But by the way, I will just say, if you haven't read the blog post on Salt Lake City, the very end of that blog post, we link to Director Bradford's own blog post, Facebook post, uh, became the front page of the Yuba Center Appeal on sort of what he's seen on all the SACOG tours and um, kind of challenging in some ways his community to think about mixed use and walkable communities. And anyway, really highly recommended. Speaking of like translating, <laughs> uh, it, was a, it was a really, really nice job by Director Bradford. Great. Thank you, James. Okay, again, thank you, Casey. And, and thank you all for the, the really good conversation. All right, uh, that brings us to reports, uh, um, committee reports, and I will open the floor. Um, if anybody would like to give a report or something to, to add. Yeah, I have one. Um, on, uh, let's see, October 20th, which is our board meeting, um, we have a, a grand opening of our museum. It's 31 years in the making, and um, I, I'm going to have to resume this meeting because uh, it's at 11 o'clock, so I don't, I don't see how I could be here in person and then rush down there at 11. But yeah, it's 11 o'clock, and uh, it's 31 years in the making. Alton Museum has its grand opening. Congratulations. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I honestly thought that building was going to fall into the street, like, not even 10 years ago. <laughs> So after the board meeting, we'll have to come see you. Yeah, I'd like rush down because like, it starts at 11. So I'm, I might have to like cut out of this one and I'm gonna have to um, go by Zoom because I don't know if I'm gonna do have some like preparation beforehand since I sit on that board as well. Well, congr well congrat congratulations on that. That's, that's great to see. Now, is, um, is there a specific uh, theme for the, um, for the museum? Well, originally it was the Bing Kong Tong and it was a gathering place. And then I think in the, like from the seventies to maybe early eighties, it was like the first floor was residential housing, but, and then it was abandoned in the nineties. So like starting in the mid two thousands, they like um, got grants together and um, like finally like got to building it. So in 2013, they did exterior and then it finished in 2014, but like like during the pandemic and a little after, or actually we were still in it, um, they finally finished the interior like last October. Great, thank you. 
I know, uh, so in, in Placerville, in El Dorado County, we did our third and final um, trip to green uh, where we kept the, the, the lights on through city of Placerville um, over the weekend, uh, Friday, Saturday. So the first weekend of October, we did it August, September and October. So we're gonna be coming back with findings. Uh, I'll share it obviously with the SACOG board as well. It was, you know, trying to find innovative ways to deal with a, a, a real problem in our community, uh, both with just traffic mitigation um, and at the same time trying to balance, you know, are we hurting our downtown businesses by doing this, those types of things. So we're gonna be kind of collecting all that, that data. I don't know if any of you might've gone through uh, either coming to Placerville or going up to Tahoe or Nevada. Uh, but, um, you know, it was smooth sailing, I, I can say, uh, always hiccups, um, and a little bit, I think, getting used to for local residents to move around on our side streets, you know, you know what we heard was people were upset because they were using all of our side streets because of ways and Google maps when people were trying to get off the freeway and get around town to, to cut through the, get around traffic. So, um, you know, we had some complaints that way as well. So we're we're working through that, trying to find ways because we know the 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 long term solution is a you know hundreds of millions of dollars and maybe isn't the the best thing for the area as well, or whether it's even needed. You know, in in twenty five years, if you know driving patterns and how we travel are are different. So, you know, all things that we're considering in in our jurisdiction, and we really um, appreciate the support as well. So, thank you. Uh, any other comments? All right, I did want to, um, Vice Chair Baines, you know, on behalf of this committee, as well as, you know, your, all your uh, colleagues and staff, I just wanted to pass along our sincere condolences on the passing of your father um, and know that you're in our thoughts and prayers and anything that we can do, please let us know. But I just wanted to, to pass along um, those condolences to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It means a lot to me. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, move. I know there might have been some uh, on item seven. It's usually just to receive and file, and uh, but I think there was some potentially some questions on on the blueprint implementation. So uh, I was going to have Clint uh, just open this item up and see if uh, we had any questions on this. Good. Hey, Chair Saragos. I'll. Uh, uh, this is James. I'll kick this off. Uh, yeah. So this morning on the transportation committee agenda, we had uh, a good discussion about, uh, we're just saying earlier about our, our tour to all the city councils and board of supervisors and the next long range plan for the region, the timeliness of having all the folks from Utah come um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, just to step back for a second, we've been on a, a cycle or a schedule to adopt our next long range plan somewhere to sort of early to mid 2024. A couple of things have happened and as um, which, which actually are good <laughs> opportunities, uh, but but weren't kind of on our radar when we began this plan update about a year ago. One of which is we got a federal raise grant for $5 million to get out and engage a lot of communities across the six counties uh, to really try to help shape um, new sort of opportunities and projects around shared active and zero emission transportation um, projects. That's fantastic. Uh, that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of engagement. We would like those things to show up in the plan. Uh, I know all of you know, uh, because we talk about this all the time, reaching our greenhouse gas target this next plan cycle is going to be very, very challenging um, on, on a number of fronts. We're gonna have to, I think, um, spend some time on these alternatives and these pathways next year, but we're gonna talk really about implementation and we want to really help focus, too, on doing really good deep engagement on the, the pathways, the alternatives in the plan, but also uh, what it means to actually implement from a housing perspective, from an infill perspective, policies. We want our, our partners, all of you as local governments, but also a lot of our funding partners to step up. That's all by way of saying we've taken a step back as staff, and uh, we think we can do a better job with this plan from an engagement perspective, from an outreach perspective, the things you were hitting on earlier, uh, if we look at an extension of the schedule between 15 and 18 months, so going from early 2024 to the fall of 25, 
And that's a lengthy extension. We, we, we completely understand that. Um, but it gives us a number of these benefits. It also potentially, um, not even potentially, it syncs us up with the Bay Area Metropolitan Transportation Commission plan cycle, which is something our mega region working group is really interested in. Um, and then just finally, to, 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 to sum up, there are some risks to this. Uh, we think we can manage those risks, but there's risks from a federal air quality conformity side, making sure that we don't get, uh, we won't run afoul of our, uh, making sure that we're in compliance with our federal air quality rules. Uh, and also on the state side, our sustainable community strategy, meeting our greenhouse gas targets, uh, that sustainable community strategy really expires in, in early, mid 2024. And to get an extension of that, we would actually have to run legislation next year and really be all in behind running a state bill to give us an extension uh, to, to allow for this, this longer schedule. That has been done before. We think we can do that and stand a very good chance of getting that, that legislation adopted, but it's a risk. Um, and if we, if we didn't get that bill next year, we begin to make uh, put ourselves a little bit at risk for some of the state transportation competitive grant programs. This is all outlined in a memo that we presented to the transportation committee this morning, but just wanted to tee that up for you all. I know you had and, some discussion about it. And James, just for clarification, so this led the legislation for the for our colleagues to know that San Diego did the same thing and, and were successful in uh, yep. in that in that legislation, correct? Yep. Sandy, you did this this a couple of years ago, back in 2020, 2019, 2020. Yeah. So it's a it's a full court press for sure. Yeah, go ahead, Director Brewer. I appreciate that update, James. And and then I think about the fact that we're going to have some new legislators. Uh, yeah. I mean, two in my area, the Elk Grove one, like there's several new state legislators uh, who are going to be coming in, and we're going to have to like get them up to speed really fast and um, a lot of them are local elected or you know been unelected um, so relationships that this board has with those folks would be really important yep. um, and I think it's one of those like yeah that's a, that's a big deal right because we have a pretty good cohesive outreach to our current legislators and that's how we got green means go but that took us a couple of years so we're gonna have to really jump on it if we were to do that yeah, I appreciate that, Director Gore. I, uh, we have definitely been thinking about those new legislators coming in. That's the one thing we do know about next year. We're going to have quite a number of new legislators in our delegation. But it's also, I think it's great from talking to many of you uh, that you all have relationships with them, largely because many of them have come out of local government. So not unlike Green Means Go a couple of years ago, we're going to, I think, need your help and those relationships to, to do some outreach. We're, we're also hopeful that we might be able to get well, they wouldn't carry all the water on it, but our Bay Area delegation, this is actually syncing up with our uh, Bay Area counterpart and MTC's long range plan, hoping we can get their support as mm -hmm. well. Thank you. And I know like for us in El Dorado County, this actually syncs up better with EDCTC as well. So the, the time you would actually would make more sense. I'm not sure about Placer um, when, when you're, uh, is, but it may actually sync up better as well. Well, for PCTPA, actually, they were on a schedule to adopt just after our original adoption date. So, uh, but we have reached out to them. We didn't go too far in our outreach so far because we wanted to brief the board and have these discussions. Um, but we have been reaching out to some of our partners, including PCTPA and EDCTC, uh, starting uh, some conversations with our state partners who are going to be critical in this. Um, so, I, I I think we're yeah I think we're on. A, we're, we're in conversation with PCTPA in particular about potentially uh, keeping uh, uh, their schedule on kind of our schedule if we push back, that they might push back as well. But those are very early. I don't want to speak for them, but um, I think there's openness with our partners so far. Okay. Um, any questions uh, for James? All right, seeing none. Thank you, James, appreciate the uh, update on that. I know it was presented, uh, so we, we appreciate it for bringing it to, to this committee as well. Thank you, uh, Chair Siragos, if you're under other matters at this point, is that where yep. we're? Yeah. Okay, good. Yes. Um, 
just a couple of things, just as reminders. Um, actually, you don't know this yet. We haven't advertised it, but your, your next committee meeting in November will be your final committee meeting of the year. Uh, because in December, uh, we've canceled the committees and we are holding a special board meeting Thursday, December 1st, 9.30 a.m. I know many of you have RSVP'd, but if you haven't, we'd love to see you. We'd love to see you in person if we can do that uh, for the final board meeting of the year. So November committees would be your last, and I'll give you a heads up now. I think they're going to be pretty full agendas. Um, in between the committees, as we have done from time to time, between transportation and land use, November 3rd, we will have a lunch session actually on our mega regional rail projects, a, a, an update report on the Capitol Corridor um, expansions and the third track to Roseville and a lot of the investments in the Capitol Corridor and also the ACE Rail and the San Joaquins coming up to Elk Grove, Midtown Sacramento Airport with this possible extension that's kind of taken off um, to Marysville and Chico. So that will be, I think, really important as we talk about mega region, as we talk about our Bay Area partners, um, and we think a little bit about advocacy next year. And as, as Director Gordon knows, um, SACOG will have the, the, the chair role again for the mega region working group. And those, those two projects are going to be critical in terms of our advocacy efforts for state funding and federal funding. So, so put that on your calendars, uh, November 3rd lunch and December 1st uh, special board meeting. All right, thank you, James. Uh, any other matters? All right then, um, so it is, uh, you'll get some time back this afternoon. It's a little bit after 2.30. So I hope everybody has a great rest of your day and a great weekend and uh, I will see all of you soon. So this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Nice to see everyone. Yep. See you, everybody. Bye.